Okay. Hi. Mm -hmm. So, let's see here. Okay. All right. I'm going to go turn off. Well, first, let's introduce Jim. So while Jim's fiddling, this is Jim Mellon, and he is an award-winning underwater photographer, and we're very excited that he finally got home based in Ames. Thank you, Carolyn. And, <laughs> and this is going to be a really interesting talk with everything from all his experiences. I'm opening it up to everything. Hopefully, you're game for that. Sure. But <laughs> got all of his experiences. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. But I'm looking at techniques. So anybody who's a photo bug, this is going to be super interesting. And for anybody who cares about the environment, this is going to be incredibly interesting. And I will turn off the lights and I'm going to okay. hand it over to you. Great. All right. And everybody can see the screen. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Carrie. I want to thank the Octagon for inviting me to do this talk. It's, uh, I think it's fun to sit here in the rain in Iowa and talk about the ocean. Um, we're still getting my arms wrapped around all of that. Um, but in this talk, actually, we reveal the true reasons I, I'm here. So. I'm sure that will be interesting. So in this talk, we're going to talk a little bit about my adventures creating underwater landscapes, um, which has kind of been the, the major force of all the work and the thing that is different about what I do that other photographers don't. Um, and part of that came about through just a love for the ocean, a love for photography, and the idea of doing something new. Basically, what that is, is <clears throat> I'm a little bit unique in that I create underwater landscapes of coral reefs when this is what an underwater landscape of a coral reef looks like. If you're able to get far enough away to see a landscape, you can't see it. Water is blue because it very effectively filters out all the red and yellow light. So when you get close enough to photograph something underwater and capture all of the colors that are really there, you're about this close. I'm holding my hand in my face. Um, and so that's why most underwater photography is wide angle photography. And you bring your own lights, you bring strobe lights so that you have full spectrum light in an environment where everything has been filtered to super, super pure blue light. So this is me actually photographing the side of a wall, you can see how close I am. And what I'm doing here is taking a lot of overlapping photos of an area that is very, very colorful. And then I take all those photographs and stitch them back together into the scene that I was trying to capture, which is the only way that I've found to actually capture the true colors and the details of a coral reef, which is interesting because they are some of the most spectacular and colorful places on earth. Um, so that's what I do. Um, I've been trying to do this for a long, long time, it seems. And how I got into it is an interesting story that I'm often asked. So that's kind of the talk tonight is how I started doing this. Uh, back in my 20s, I was an electrical engineer. And even though I was working on some pretty cool little projects, um, I worked for a company that did a lot of government research, and we built things like the world's first rail gun, which uses electromagnetic energy to accelerate a projectile and hopefully can do things like shoot down ballistic missiles and lots of fun stuff like that. But I always got a real kick out of photographing these projects, and I've been doing photography since I was a kid, and that's what really drew me to the exciting part of working in this cutting edge technology is I got to use special cameras to try to photograph bullets in flight and do some pretty special kinds of photography. At the same time, I was discovering a whole different world. I was starting to scuba dive in the mid eighties and 
all of a sudden that was a new thing that turned me on. And one of the realizations that I made is I might never be able to be an astronaut, but in the ocean is a world where you can discover a new species of life every day. We still have an idea that we might know about 15% of what's in the ocean and the rest is waiting to be discovered. What was the percentage, Jim? 15 or 50? Depends on who you talk to. The number varies between seven and 15, depending on who's telling the story, but it's just a, the majority of what's in the ocean we still have yet to discover. So I changed my course and I decided I needed to look for a job with a company that was doing something on the water. And I was really fortunate to find a company that was building an underwater sensor that was based on laser technology. And I got hired as one of the engineers in this project. My, my job was to design the control system for it. And so since I designed the control system, I was the only operator of the system. And I got to travel around the world with it in the uh, early, early 90s. And this was really my first underwater camera. That was a very, very cool thing at the time because there was a lot of emphasis on this type of platform. This filled a very interesting position in underwater imaging because you have ROVs that can go and closely inspect something. And then you have different types of sonar that can see shapes from a distance. But with this technology from 150 feet away, you can image an entire airplane wreck. And although the imagery was um, varied in its resolution, you could see things that, that you couldn't see without, with any other technology. So this is a really cool thing for me to be involved in. And that quickly led to me developing an expertise in putting this imagery together. We would go out with this system and do what we call mow the lawn to try to cover an entire survey area. And at the time that digital imaging was just starting to develop, it became one of my tasks to learn how to put this imagery together so that I could take all the different bathymetry and side sky and sonar data and laser data and try to put it together into one big picture. And that's when, in 1992, I discovered Photoshop 1.0 and I started doing this kind of thing on my own. At the same time, I was learning how to do underwater photography and spending a lot of time in the water when I could on vacations, traveling to destinations where I could pursue that. The trick with underwater photography that I kind of mentioned before is you have to get close. Close, close, close. Closer, the better. Because water removes red and yellow light extremely fast. When you're five feet away from something, you can no longer get full spectrum color through that water. So for me, it was a particular interest because my view of the ocean from doing all this oceanographic work was big. I saw things on a big scale. And when I saw things underwater and would take a picture and light them up, I could not see anything that was five feet away, even though I know that right behind that is another really colorful thing. And I know from being in this one particular spot that it's one of the most colorful places on earth, but you just can't take a picture of it. So I had gone to this one location that is known for its sheer walls of just incredibly compact marine life. But if you back up and take a picture of it, it all looks blue and fuzzy. So that's when I conceived of uh, the idea of what if I took the techniques I was using for this oceanographic kind of data, and I did it with close-up high-resolution photography. So I would take an area like this, divide it up into little cells, and then go photograph everything up close. That became my focus and my first big project. Um, that became a goal to pick an area in the world, with incredibly dense marine life, and create this life-size image. So in order to do that, I had to spend a couple of years going through the motions and designing the equipment and trying to figure out what the parameters were, how much water I could look through, what the optics needed to be, what the lighting needed to be. And I designed this platform that I took eventually down to the Cayman Islands to this site that I had seen 10 years before. 
to photograph this wall of marine life. This is me actually photographing that wall with an assistant. And this is what that wall looked like. And incidentally, this is the same image as we've been looking at as my example of a landscape that you can't take. This is the exact image. That is that. And if we were to go back and forth, you could trace out the different, you could find all of the different artifacts, but this is the same width as this image here. So this image, my first project was accomplished by creating this platform. At the time, we did not have digital imaging. We did not have digital cameras. This was shot on film. And basically, I created a program where I was able to, I was able to delineate the, the section of the wall that I was going to photograph break it up into individual parts and follow these columns and photograph this in an array of columns and rows that would eventually lead to 300 individual photographs, all of which were later drum scanned, which back in, this was done in 1999. In 1999, it cost about $200 to have a drum scan made from a piece of film. So we did, over 350 drum scans to create the digital images that created this final image. So that image I finished uh, after about six months worth of post-production time. That image was in National Geographic in 2001 and was essentially the start of my career. <clears throat> um, I went back and optimized a few other things and photographed another wall was very similar, but at that time, my particular technique worked great as long as you could photograph a sheer wall. I worked for another seven years to get to the point where I could photograph something that had more depth. At the end of that time, basically seven years ago, in 2007, I produced the first image of a coral reef that had pretty much unlimited depth. And after producing a couple of images there in this environment that I had worked in for seven years, sleeping on people's floors and getting there any way I could. Um, my next project became, what am I gonna photograph now? So in 2004, a paper came out by research scientists that identified the 13 important areas around the world for biodiversity. They are the hotspots of marine biodiversity these are the areas where in ice ages have formed mud puddles that isolated landlocked areas and endemic species developed. And in these places all over the world, you have a whole group of species that have developed in that area only. Those areas are the important hotspots of marine biodiversity. So they included places that were World Heritage Sites. Unfortunately for me, they're all in the tropics, so the water is all really clear and warm and 85 degrees, and I have to work out of uh, resorts. And, um, it's been tough. I, basically, I set my sights on a list of places that I'm about halfway through. So this, this is in Komodo, Indonesia. Uh, this is a place we were just at in 2018, one of our last eye trips before uh, COVID kicked in. This is known as one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. The uh, very island in the Philippines is regarded by scientists as being the center of the center of marine biodiversity. Um, so what I do now is find a project that I can figure out a way to develop a relationship with the resort or take groups of people there, some place to pay the cost of being able to work there for weeks or months. And then we travel there, create these images, and then try to market them. Um, in 2009, National Geographic 
versus Emery Kristoff, which is one of the most famous photographers in the world who uh, shot the first photographs of the Titanic. Uh, National Geographic was going to put some new cool uh, technology thing in Explorers Hall, and they wanted to use my images on these super resolution tiled monitor displays that were made by UCSD in California. Um, and that started a really cool project where Geographic asked me to go back and photograph 10 years later the first site that I photographed in 1999. Um, unfortunately, some changes in Geographic caused that whole program to go away, but we had already started the process and I was able to turn a lot of my sponsors into, or a lot of my vendors into sponsors and I got a little bit of sponsorship from Intel and a few others to get the ball rolling. I was able to raise the money to go and shoot this project again. Uh, this time we had a little bit more money to put into the platform. And so my platform originally was passive in that it had flotation on it that would keep its attitude and help me keep it in the right place. But the whole purpose of this platform was to maintain the attitude of the camera in relation to the image I was photographing because as it moves just a little bit, it skews everything a great deal. So what you really want is to have a camera on a tripod, but you're in the water and have no bottom. So we developed a camera with a tripod. This, instead of a tripod, this camera platform has eight really high-tech thrusters on it and computer programs, and uh, it has the kind of sensors that are in your iPhone that can tell every direction that it moves. And so as the platform moves in any particular direction, it uses the thrusters to counter that and keep the platform in one place. So this is where my design experience in the past and a group of people that I used to work with on the laser group came back and play. And with me and a couple of my friends, we designed this new computer stabilized platform to do that job. Um, we also did a documentary about the whole project that was originally going to be on National Geographic. And again, we ended up with another sponsor, but we did produce a documentary about the project that uh, went into a rotation of theaters and uh, science centers that have theaters and was part of the program that went into that subscription number. Uh, so we had a bit more of a crew then. It was me, me and two other people the first time around. Um, this time we had a lot of other people to take care of. Uh, this is me and an assistant going down this wall. And you can see how sheer this is. It's actually as sheer as the side of a building. It's incredibly, it goes on for about a mile like what, what depth are you there, Jim? Can you uh, here we're close to the top. This is a pretty amazing place for topography. The, the terrain of the beach is rather shallow, and it'll, only about 250 yards offshore at a depth of 15 to 18 feet, it just starts plumbing down. Mm -hmm. So the top of this wall that we almost at the top at the very top of this image is close to probably 25 to 30 feet. And down what we're seeing at the bottom here is close to 90 feet. The area of the image that I shot, the top was 70 feet and the bottom was 90 feet. So uh, again, this is me shooting that with an assistant and a platform. We had another picture earlier with a photographer. This was a high, high enough profile project that we had well, we had photographers take pictures of photographers take pictures of me. <laughs> um, and this is the image we produced, and I'm not going to do it in a back and forth, but the basis of this was also incorporating a group of scientists to study the changes in this environment over 10 years. So this was, well, you get an idea of the resolution of this too. Right down here, yeah. this little fish here, that's about life size. So this image at life size goes another 70 feet that way and another 20 feet high. Um, so out of that, 
a, uh, a group called the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. Um, did a coral count where basically they go and they count every species of coral along this whole track and they came up with an overall estimation the reef is healthy but there's a lower overall coral count here in a very pristine environment over 10 years which shows that all those factors that people are talking about whether they're global warming or or ocean acidification, lots of different factors have gone in together too. Even in one of the most pristine areas in the world with the least pressure, it's still challenged and it's still losing coral. Uh, outside of that, uh, the images over the years from 1991 to 2010 and some in between shows the growth rate of sponges and the health of sponges. In this case, this was a fully adult sponge, but it had been destroyed by storms and broken up, and then now it's in some new state of health. Um, here's another one here. Oh, I had another one that was great that showed uh, a sponge that was baseball size in one in the previous image, and now it's the size of a trash can. So that's the rate of growth of that sponge. Another really huge change is an invasive species, the lionfish that belong in Indonesia in 2009 were discovered in the Caribbean, and now they are a new endemic species in our Caribbean waters. Um, and then the really cool thing about that project is in the end, that information was shared across the UCSD peer platform with other networks and other universities where other scientists could collaborate on the data. And that's just showing both images being reviewed on that platform. Um, another really cool thing that came out of that uh, project, one of the things that had happened over that 10 year period, it just so happens that the area that we picked to do that first image of the reef wall at Bloody Bay happened to be the same area that a coral scientist picked to start the Little Cayman Research Institute. So during that 10 years, they have been using that data as a baseline because it greatly uh, improved on some of the transects that they did. It was their largest data set. It covered more area and had a higher resolution than the other types of uh, transects they do. So a number of scientists had come out to do projects associated with that, one being a group of researchers that were researching coral fluorescence. And they had picked that area basically because they already had this ground truth image that they could work within. And they had a white light version of everything. So they talked me into staying longer and uh, doing another series of fluorescence photography using their technology, which essentially was specific line frequency filters that and light sources that would focus on a very narrow spectrum of blue light. And the object, the way fluorescence works is you shine, in this case, blue light at an object and it fluoresces and gives off a different color light. In most cases, it's green. This is showing the green fluorescent protein that's in corals. And in other situations could be orange or red. In this case, it's red and orange coming from chlorophyll that's covering the reef substrate. So this is important to marine science because these fluorescent proteins become markers that they can use in medical science to tag and and monitor the development of diseases and things within your body that are happening. Specifically, these scientists were looking for specific colors and they were looking specifically for far and for red that would help neuroscientists map what's going on in your brain and could actually watch synapses in your brain firing because of the fluorescent or the uh, infrared frequency of these 
proteins could transfer through your skull. So um, basically I'm working with the scientists to do a project that is aimed at showing some of this information at uh, the Museum of Natural History in New York. In the end, we produced, we produced a full size image, the same as the white light version, but all in fluorescence. A subset of that appeared in the show with some money from the National Science Foundation in the traveling show that has been traveling for the last 10 years called Creatures of Light. And that started at the New York Museum of Natural History in New York. And it features the white light image on projected on a big screen. And then there's a kiosk that lets you highlight portions of that. And then you can see what those things look like under fluorescent light and see the fluorescent colors that are exhibited by the corals and chlorophyll. And the interesting thing, this little eel. I was gonna say, there's like a worm in there. <laughs> well, this eel is a pretty famous little eel. The story of fluorescence is back in the 60s, scientists were noticing that jellyfish glowed blue. And a big effort was made to isolate that protein and figure out why jellyfish glow and how they could use that protein. And pretty soon they started finding all different kinds of species of jellyfish that glow different kinds of blues. Along the way, in that frenzy, a Russian scientist noticed that the corals in his fish tank were glowing. And so now all the scientists are looking for corals and finding that different corals exhibit different frequencies of fluorescence. When we did this image, this we're photographing in an almost pitch black environment where we can't see anything except really dim light until I'm flashing my big strobes and then you really can't see anything. But somewhere in there, this eel swam through my friend and the scientists thought I was playing a joke on them and thought I had photoshopped this little eel because he's glowing with the same green fluorescence. This was the first documented case of fluorescence in a fish. And this started scientists on a whole new thing, finding all the fish that glow. And now they're finding a lot of fish glow, turtles glow, all kinds of so that was kind of exciting for me. That little eel became the subject of a uh, Nova series a couple of uh, years ago called Creatures of Light. So this is a part of this Creatures of Light series that is uh, rotating through science centers and natural history centers. And you can actually go see this next summer in Peoria. I hope they need it after What's that? I hope they named it after you. No. <laughs> no. Dang it. Anyway, um, they paid me for it. <laughs> no. It turns out payment is a so serious, the most sincere form of flattery. Um, so that was my uh, potential ending point because I didn't know how long they were going to take here. But I do have some more things to show if we want to stay in there. Are there any questions right now for Jim over what he's Yeah. Doing? How many times have you been approached by the U.S. Department of Defense or its Russian or Chinese counterparts? <laughs> None. Oh, good. <laughs> they don't know you exist in them. Well, I haven't done anything to gather their attention, and I haven't talked about any of the things I'm not supposed to, <laughs> as far as I know. So, otherwise, you'd have to. Kill him. Uh, so yes. Uh, um, so, like in a pitch black environment, do you, is it known why these things have these colors? Is that to attract things that eat from them, or do we know? We're we still eat? discovering all of them, yeah. but I think there's a lot of evidence that show that that it's it's intrinsic in communication, protection. Um, there especially where in, in environments where there is no light. Animals use light for everything. And um, communication is a huge thing. Um, defense. Uh, but it's, 
you know, it's ongoing science. So where we can't see it, a lot of these fish, is, fish can just Oh, like, yeah. That, a lot of things that's, that are happening right now is learning more about the spectral differences in what we see and what other animals see. And so this is one that converges where we can see a lot of these same, same things. Um, living in this environment, they, you know, animals do it naturally. We're just learning about it. But um, like now that, now that I have been diving in these areas and photographing fluorescence, I can see it during the daylight now. But before, it, it, you know, it's fringe. It's, it's there within your vision's capability, but it's not something that you're keen to notice because we're used to a different visual pattern. So. Um, would, would it have anything to do with, since light, the water absorbs almost all the spectrum of light that we can see that animals yes, in the I'm, ocean yeah, are. Yeah, I'm sure. That, and you know, we're seeing these animals fluoresce in response to blue light. That blue light is the same blue light that they're exposed to at, at that depth. Right. So So they're um, just they just have the adaptation to see in those frequencies. Yep. Yeah. But it could be a lot more than that because it could be a lot more of the non-visible spectrum that we don't even yeah, that's what I, are yeah. not even aware of. And that's where a lot of research is going right now. Um, so now that we keep seeing this, <laughs> this was a fun project. This was, uh, I got the opportunity to work with the Department of Environment in Cayman Islands, uh, photographing the NASA spawning aggregation. So the Nassau groupers are a species of fish that have, an, uh, they have a, an unfortunate method of reproduction every year at the same time, they all get together and spawn. So they do this repetitively at sites that become known and fishermen are very good at finding these sites and taking the entire breeding population in one shot. And this is one reason why you don't find Nassau groupers in Nassau, they're becoming uh, an endangered species. There are fewer and fewer of these successful spawning aggregation sites. And one of them was uh, this protected little island in Little Cayman. Unfortunately, in about 2002, uh, fishermen there found this site. And from all over the islands, they came to this one spot and they took a major portion of the population. They took so many fish that they couldn't take them to market and most of them rotted at the docks and it created a very uh, controversial issue. And one group in particular, a group of scientists convinced the government to, to uh, declare a potential uh, a temporary moratorium and created a yearly research project to go and study these animals as they try to implement protections. So um, I had the opportunity a couple of times to go and photograph the spawning aggregation as it was happening. Um, part of that was to try to help with that environmental awareness that would make some, make a fisherman want to go do this. And you know, you think if you can educate people to understand that these, this is your breeding population, this is what you want to protect, not what you want to decimate. Uh, so the idea is, you know, I was going to create these super wide images of the breeding population there so that we could show the population what's going on here and why they need to protect this. This is them actually spawning. Um, so we came up with plans to how to produce this and programs that could show the public and the fishing communities, why they need to protect this instead of take advantage of it. But we just still ran into too much opposition. Um, it became feared that the other side is going to see this and say, look at all these fish, you're crazy. You know, you've just shown us proof of how many fish are there. So anyway, um, another project is, uh, I was approached by the Aquarium of the Pacific who wanted to line the glass windows of a new planned uh, addition to the aquarium. 
We wanted to line the windows with structural glass with imagery in them that would appear as though you're looking out into a kelp forest. So basically I spent three months photographing kelp plants up close and doing the same pro process of stitching them into larger mosaics of images. The whole point being to create this very high resolution, well lit image of a California kelp forest. And then that was, we used the UCSD uh, modern system to proof it because we could, we could display it at like actual size. And then it was image panel by panel into structural glass panels that now line the addition of this aquarium. So when you're inside looking out, it does look like you're looking out into an underwater environment. Yes. Um, and that's in Long Beach. That's in Long Beach, California. Uh, this is another architectural project uh, where I was asked to create an image to go along with the creation of an observation tower in Grand Cayman. And it started out as let's photograph a natural reef and then it, it became a project to be more educational and as you walk up these staircases they wanted to be able to see a turtle here and a grouper here and a swordfish here and a ray up here so that a different animal was coming into view every time so it became a very uh, structured image but something that i spent about a year putting together and then they spent about $3 million to have that image rendered in tiny Italian glass tiles, which is kind of cool because it's a whole different level of artistry and it's timeless. Somebody saw that and they were building, they were building a modest home, <laughs> wanted to have a coral cool reef tile treatment at the bottom of the swimming pool. Hey, you didn't get permission to, the, to take pictures of my second house. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not telling anybody where it is though. <laughs> anyway, so um, it actually did work out really well. I spent many months photographing all the elements down looking on actual reefs, building this image, and then with the water inside the pool, when you look at this disappearing edge pool the right way over the breakers there, it does look like this pool is a tide pool of the ocean out there. It, it ended up very effective. Um, other projects have been covering, covering walls, uh, and quite a few different wall coverings for different locations. Uh, this is a project with Hertz. They started branding different uh, airport uh, car rental places with things like Seeds from the San Diego Zoo, so when it came in, it was a stingray. Uh, this is a project we did for uh, the reef organization for their visitor center. And then we show things in galleries, uh, not so much anymore. I think we're down to two major galleries now the Octagon and the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> 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 Uh, we've done a number of different installations over the years, and we're getting ready to go do a show that we do every year. And this is a cool little project that we do with. Uh, I was asked to do by a resort group that I had done under work for, who purchased a new resort and was going to make it their flagship resort. They asked me to do an image of a very special place, but they didn't know what they wanted. So in the beginning, they did the, the designs for their bar and they designed in this 50 foot image, which at the beginning was blank. And they said, you can go do whatever you want. So Carolyn and I went down to the Cayman Islands there for 18 weeks in different trips. And we would go down there and they would give us a boat and say, it's all yours, go where you want. And we spent months just going around the island trying to figure out what we wanted to shoot. And in the end, we chose this place, this particular location, uh, we chose because it was close to the resort. It was one of the places that they would probably dive. And it's gonna be hard to see here. I'm not sure what pictures I have here, but it was known that there was an old anchor in this one location. 
So it's a little bit hard to see here, but it's actually right, right there. Oh, there so in picking out this huge area, we spent uh, eight months altogether photographing this spot. Uh, did more than 20,000 images and more than 2,500 images were used in the final mosaic to make this image. Um, and then it was printed in San Diego and then at the resort. Um, no, I thought I had something different here. To show this, I mean, you could actually get on your phones if you have if you have Wi-Fi, if you have uh, connection capability on your phones. Now you can get on your phones and go to CoralAnchors.com, and that website is about this image. And if you click the picture of the girl that looks like where is it? I saw her. There if you is. click this picture of this girl here, it goes to a viewer and you can see this entire image. And so this is very similar to a lot of my work. It is a 30, it's a 3300 megapixel image or a 3.3 gigapixel image. And on the website, you can see the whole image, which is hundreds of feet across. And you can zoom in to a fish's eyeball. And I'm not kidding. So literally, you could explore that whole reef without getting in the water. That website's on the back of his business card. I'm going to put them right here. So if you want to look at it, you can grab on the card on your way out. So that's all I brought with me. I know nothing about underwater photography. Any questions? What? Yeah, but oh. And, and repeat the question so the viewers oh, okay. can get up. So go ahead. Oh, I know oh. nothing about underwater photography, but what sort of obstacles do you have to try to keep equipment operable in the water? Is that a major problem? Well, it shouldn't be, but I'm pretty lazy. So, so it, you need to really, you know, it's, it's a salt environment. So um, it's, it's cleaning intensive and cleaning your gear is, you know, it's all susceptible to corrosion and rust. So um, a lot goes into just cleaning and maintaining your gear. Um, there are, you know, there are issues where you're taking you're taking a ten thousand dollar camera and putting it inside of a housing and then throwing it in the ocean. So you want to make sure that that is sealed, and when it doesn't, that becomes kind of a bummer. Um, so you kind of count an underwater photographer's experience by how many useless cameras are laying around in this room, and hopefully that's not too many. These days, we have a lot more protections in that we can um, we can pull a vacuum on a housing and know that it's sealed before we take it in the water. So there, there are a few more niceties like that. Um, but it's very equipment intensive. Diving itself is. Um, the problem with cameras to begin with is it's not a good thing to take a camera in the water until you have diving down. So, um, it, it needs to be kind of second nature to you. So uh, and that goes hand in hand. Your, your diving experience and your comfort in the water uh, limits entirely what you can do with a camera. Are you diving deep enough that you have to worry about coming up slowly or not when you're taking these pictures? Uh, well, you know what? It turns out the most dangerous area, the most dangerous part of the water column for a diver. And recreational dive limits are considered to be 130 feet. More and more people are limiting that uh, with um, 
their own methodology or rules to keep people safe. But the most dangerous part of the water column is zero to 30 feet. That's where the highest pressure differential is. And the times that I have been hurt have been in that area and places where people feel relatively safe, but I'm doing something unique where I may be going up and down and up and down in that most dangerous area. And um, outside of that, sport diving is kind of designed around safety. So we're generally diving and uh, we're, we're diving at the kind of depths where you don't think about uh, particular danger, but inherently you have limitation on how fast you can ascend. We always do, regardless of how much time we've spent in the water or at what depth, we always do what, what are called safety stops, where we do the first level of decompression just as a safety. So it's not required, but it would be what you did if you, you entered the first stage of uh, decompression diving where you needed to do a decompression stop, that would be it. And we do that every time. So, um, how long are you able to stay down under the water? And that is related to depth. That's, yeah. That's drastically related to depth. And I'll give you a good example. Uh, these are outside limits, outside limits, but for most people. But if if you were to put on a scuba tank and go three feet under the water. You could stay there for about six hours. You'd probably, probably breathe for three to six hours. Apparently, you could breathe for seven hours. But if you take that same tank to 180 feet, you can bring, breathe that whole tank in four minutes. Personal wow. experience. So that's a big difference. And then, how long does it take you to get up to get the new tank? In? Since I, where you get your air from. <laughs> That's a story we won't tell. Okay. But the, actually, the good news is if you were to run out of air completely, say uh, 100 feet, you would probably get two more breaths on the way up because air is constantly expanding as you're rising. Uh -huh. So it's, it, how much time you spend is all related to your profile and how you're diving and um, also to your comfort level and your point of relaxation. Um, so it depends on how hard you're working, what you're doing, what depths you're at and, and a whole variety of factors. Generally, we are geared toward being underwater for 45 minutes to an, half, an hour and a half at a time. That's the problem because you have to set up and then how do you get to take pictures? And well, it, it could be lots of anything. It could yeah. be just getting to where you're getting, going. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is, did you ever have to overcome fear of certain underwater creatures that you were once afraid of but are no longer afraid of at all? Just Carolyn. Yeah. <laughs> um, you gotta remember, you gotta repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I never had any real ones because I always thought that it was phony in the beginning. There was, I mean, there were some key movies in the beginning in the 70s, Jaws, for example. Yeah. And then um, a real famous movie was The Deep. Nick Nolte, and in that, in that, they came across the vicious moray eel that ripped his face off. That doesn't happen. <laughs> Most things that are purported to rip your face off really stop short of that. And the, the truth of the matter is, most things are more afraid of you than you are of them, even sharks. So we go to a place where there are sharks and we call them to try to get them to come to us um. rather than afraid of them and that's that's the problem is getting them to stick around and so they don't want anything to do with you once they realize you're not you're not their friends we have my other question kind of wonky but did okay. you ever see anything in the water that was so unexplicable and strange you never talked about it because people would say you're crazy 
No. Okay. <laughs> well, this is all about that. Once you get into diving, the first thing that people tend to go through is, oh, I want to, I want to identify everything I'm seeing. So now people become marine biologists and all of a sudden they want to know the names of every little fish there and pretty soon they're, they're spouting off scientific names. Um, and then the other thing that happens is people are constantly finding new species. Mm -hmm. So we have some very good friends uh, that write books on identifying different species of different animals around the world in different ocean environments. And they are constantly themselves coming across new animals. And if you were to take a picture of something and you can't find it in one of their books, you send it to them, they'll find out what it is and you might get to name it. But I mean, there are enough new things in the ocean that any one of us could go get in the ocean anywhere, except names, and <laughs> find something brand new that nobody has ever been able to describe. Thank so, you. Yeah. It's more a matter of, guess what I saw? Then you better have a picture. Yeah. <laughs> Me. Have you ever seen a mermaid? I have seen a mermaid. <laughs> so when I showed you, when I first, what changed my life most is, uh, okay. When I decided I was going to go photograph these hot spots of biodiversity, and I set my sights on the first place to do that, it was this place here called Tubataha in the Philippines. And I had two challenges. One is I wanted to photograph these areas I hadn't seen before. And the other is I wanted to do, I had done these projects where I chartered a boat and I was spending $5,000 a day, and I wanted to do this from uh, an organized trip that wasn't going to cost me that much. So I did, I had gotten on a liverboard to do this project, and it wasn't just me, it was me and another uh, National Geographic photographer, but also on that boat were groups of other divers. And that's where I met Carolyn, and that has resulted in me coming to Iowa. So if it was not for, for Tibetaha and the Philippines and Carolyn, I would be here. Okay, you were talking about um, the dive and what was the creatures? The green fluorescent protein? Yeah. Yes. So how did they, did they extract that somehow to uh, use it? To characterize it? Right. So that whole process has been going on since scientists were first trying to characterize the, the proteins in jellyfish in the 60s. And probably more scientific papers have been written on that than anything else in medical science because of its potentials. And at the time I got involved with these guys, uh, 150 different frequencies of this fluorescence had been found and, and isolated. And they had done 50 of them. And they're up to many more now. Um, so their whole game plan is exactly that. Finding new frequencies and then taking it in the laboratory and extracting it and, and, and being able to refuse other cells with that. I'm not an expert on that whole process, but um, I think it's pretty routine for them. But their you know, their focus is in finding new variations. I don't know. I'm mean, sure that is another option of that. Is uh, I mean they are finding these things specific frequencies for use in markers for different diseases that have different characteristics. But I'm sure there are other groups that are using the same techniques to try to find new toxins that can become medicines and other, you know, other applications. Okay. Try just the photo deck. <laughs>
Oh. Well, that was like a stingray or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's a different presentation. She did like yeah, a stingray yeah. presentation. <laughs> that, by the way, was a just a totally bizarre thing. We yeah, dive with stingrays all the time, wild and friendly. And um, it's, it's just, just a bizarre, yeah. a bizarre event. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, when are you finally going to admit that that eel was Photoshop? <laughs> you know, I'll never be a major player anyway, so it really doesn't matter. But um, you'll never find out. <laughs> I mean, I'll never find out. Um, I think you should tell people about your studio and how you print your books and oh. you're available for that. Okay. Um, one of the things I'm doing in Iowa is I have a, I print all the, I print all the things that I produce uh, that we sell in galleries, uh, which is a, a big part of uh, my living. So, um, I do have a shop here where I print all the things that I do. And pretty much I do almost any kind of commercial printing process other than uh, printing process. So uh, I do work for other artists. If there are artists that uh, would be interested in having me do prints for them, that's a possibility. I don't. I have two artists now that I've printed for that have I've printed for for years and years, and um, I still do. Other than that, it's, I don't have a lot of regular customers, uh, but I used to do quite a bit of commercial work. So that's available if there are artists that are interested in having printed done. And I want to steal the mic and say so. All of the work that's downstairs in the shop was printed by Jim. Jim is our featured artist for the shop, and so all of his work is 15% off this month. So if you ever wanted a piece of his, today's the day to get it. And we do have the, that beautiful photo of uh, the sea turtle that you, that's on aluminum downstairs, right? Yeah. yeah. And we also have a, a, you know, so he prints on aluminum and canvas, and that fun fabric that sticks to the wall. So we have several of those. Um, and if they want to buy it, don't limit yourself to 15%. Make sure they just find a deal. Well, I'll let you talk to him on that. But <laughs> Anyway, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks for wearing your mask. Thank you, and thank you Jim. Thanks, Karen. And yeah, and it'll be on YouTube. So if you want to watch it again, Thank you. I can't believe how smooth this was with the projector. Yeah.